Welcome to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. It's our pleasure today to have uh, Professor Matthew Wright from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, Matt has been working on topics in uh, security and privacy for well over a decade and uh, is uh, one of the senior people in the touch community, in the privacy enhancing technologies community. Um, he will be talking to us today about uh, why it's okay to use your cat's name as a password as long as your cat's name is five underscore M capital F <laughs> dollar sign seven underscore Q and it was generated by a computer. So let's welcome him. Thank you, Ian. Ooh, clapping before the talk. That's a good sign. All right, so, um, yep, so as Ian mentioned, this is where I work. Uh, that's the little symbol that we use for our lab. All right, so what happens when we ask users to come up with their own passwords? Well, we know that the results are not pretty, uh, at least from a security perspective. Uh, users come up with passwords that are easy to remember um, and uh, also easy to guess in a lot of cases. Uh, furthermore, they tend to reuse passwords on many sites and sometimes that's fine if your New York Times password and your weather.com password are the same. I don't think it's probably going to lead to anybody dying, but there's other circumstances where you probably don't want to reuse your passwords. Now, if you're sitting in this room, your passwords probably are not P-A-S-S-W-R-D, uh, but you're probably either getting or currently hold an advanced degree in computer science or mathematics, so maybe you're not the best sample set. Um, and of course, uh, and you know, you know, you go to sites, uh, especially security sensitive sites like banks and so on, and they have password strength meters, and they say, no, you have to have capital letters and special characters and numbers in your passwords to make them stronger. But uh, does that actually make passwords stronger? And of course the answer is, well the research says that the answer is basically no. People have predictable tricks um, and worse, hackers know what those tricks are and they don't know just because they are also people who create passwords, they are also people who steal passwords. And so they have gotten a hold of large data sets of passwords, some of which are publicly available, um, and some of which uh, are just owned by Russian hacker gangs, so you know, don't worry about it too much. Um, and of course, so they have all this data that lets them figure out uh, all the interesting tricks that people use to uh, enhance, the, enhance the strength of their passwords. So all of the leet uh, character changes and putting a number that changes every month when your password has to be changed at the end of your password that increments each month. Um, well, those tricks are, all, of course, very familiar to attackers. And furthermore, uh, even if most of the people using a password uh, authentication system have pretty good passwords, passwords that are not easily guessable um, and uh, even though they might, some of them may be crackable uh, with a, you know, modern GPU technology and so on. As far as uh, online attacks where you actually have to input the attack through the regular um, password field, you know, where there's some limitations on that. But of course, if 10% or 5% or even 1% of all the users in the system have very bad, very guessable passwords, well, then you're going to have compromises on 1% of uh, all of the system, all of the accounts in the system. And from a system administrator point of view, that's terrible. Now I would argue that a lot of the problem that we see with passwords is that we are putting too much of a burden on the users. You know, some burdens are bigger than others, but the burden that we're putting on users is, hey, come up with a string. It should be secure even though you're not a security expert and don't necessarily know what makes a password secure. It should be memorable, although you're not a memory expert and you don't necessarily know how to make something memorable unless it's really easy to guess. Um, and find some way to memorize this specially crafted string of information. Given those circumstances, 
it's really not any wonder that passwords are not a very good authentication system. And you know, if you were to go to a usability person today and say that there had never been passwords before and you say, I need to create a user authentication system and here's my plan, right, and you tell them about passwords, yeah, they think they would probably be very unhappy with you. And they would say that is a terrible idea because of all the burden that you're putting on users. So now I'm going to talk about system assigned passwords, which at first blush are not going to look much better from a usability perspective, but we'll get to that. The great thing about system assigned passwords is that they provide a guaranteed level of security. If you have a password that's say six lowercase letters randomly selected, then you get 28 bits of entropy. And it's just consistent across all users. Um, you don't have 90% of users with good passwords and 10% with bad passwords. Everybody has the same quality of password. If you want to ensure that you have a higher level of security, say 56 bits of security, well then you can, uh, if your system of usability requirements enable it, then you can double the length of your password. Right? If it still works, then uh, if it's still memorable, then that could still be viable in your system. Uh, in one of the systems I'm going to talk about, we just have the user typing in the password in the normal way that you do. Um, and one of the things that's important in passwords these days is we all have mobile devices. And mobile devices, one of the big problems with them is that typing of passwords is really, really bad. It's one of the things that when you ask users in a survey, well, what are the things that you don't like about working and interfacing with your mobile device? Entering in passwords is one of the, the top things on the list because you have to go switch between the uppercase character and the lowercase character, or now go to the special, special characters, and oh no, th not those special characters, the other special characters, and then the numbers. Um, and so it's pretty painful to create a, uh, you know, a more complex password. But if we can just give people lowercase letter passwords, that would be easier to type. Uh, so here are some not actually system assigned, but random looking sort of passwords, six character strings that we might uh, assume to be generated. And of course the challenge with system assigned passwords is now you don't remember what those other characters are for the most part. Right? So system assigned passwords are generally speaking difficult to remember. So the challenge that we're trying to take on is, well, we've got these system assigned passwords. We know they're secure, minimum level of security, so tunable, so these are nice features. Uh, and we're gonna try to help people actually remember them. Uh, and that way, we don't put this burden on the user of teaching them, uh, of having them come up with these strings that are supposed to be secure, and we also don't we try to limit the burden on the user about what they, how do they figure out how to memorize these passwords. Instead, we're essentially trying to teach them how to memorize passwords. Um, and the key idea that we're going to apply is queues. And I'll talk about that uh, as we continue. So the first thing, uh, yes. Okay, so there's actually two threat models that, uh, <clears throat> okay, so the question is, um, what is the threat model? Uh, is it a dictionary attack type of model? And there's actually two threat models that we'll consider. One threat model is where the attacker may be making <coughs> guesses through the standard password interface. So they don't have, so the dictionary attack model, the general uh, dictionary attack model is, the attacker has actually stolen the backend database uh, that the server uses to check people's passwords with. And that uh, is um, going to be stored in a way that uh, is not possible for the attacker to actually read them directly. But, excuse me, but if he can guess what the password is, he can check it against the entry and see if it's correct. 
So that's one attack model. And if in that attack model, um, the, uh, the requirements on the password have to be quite strong because the attacker can try many, many guesses. Um, and we'll, exp mm, we'll hint at uh, directions to deal with that in this talk, but for the most part, the focus of the talk is on an easier attack model in which the attacker never gets that database and is just trying passwords in the front end. And so one of the things that might happen is you, um, there's such a thing as a popular password attack. So you have a website and the attacker goes and tries for all the accounts he can figure out the usernames for. He tries a, uh, the most popular one, two, three, four, five, however many are allowed before the account gets locked out, passwords on every account in the system. And basically just trying until he gets into some number of accounts. Right. So then in that case, it's very bad to have a system where you have a few very popular passwords and a heavy tail of all these other passwords. Uh, the heavy tail will never get successfully cracked in this case, but those few um, popular passwords will get picked off and let people into a few accounts. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three different uh, aspects of our research. First of all, we have a system called QDAR where we're going to apply different cues, multiple types of cues to help people remember their system assigned passwords. Um, then we're going to go into a discussion of some additional detailed studies that we've done to investigate whether some cues are better than others and what other things that we can learn about the use of cues in these systems. And then we have uh, a brief discussion of a technique called the memory palace, um, which is going to enable us to have passwords that are just text only where you just type them in, which has some uh, useful advantages as well. Okay, so starting off, we're gonna talk about QDAR. Uh, this was work that was published at CHI this year. Um, I'm gonna come back to this, but I'll show you briefly kind of what the QDAR system looks like. This is one of what would be six different frames that we would have. On each of these frames or portfolios, we would have a set of, you see these pictures of animals in this case, and in this version of the QDAR system, we'd have, uh, for example, another panel might be flowers, another panel might be technology or vehicles, and on each one we have a whole set in, of 26 different animals or, or whatever it is. And you see on the right hand side we have uh, the picture, we have the name of the animal, and on the left we have different types of factual information. So again, I'll go back over this uh, in a few minutes, but. Ah, okay, uh, system assigned, right? So system assigned password, very important in QDAR because yes, otherwise everyone picks the kitten. Uh, in fact, so there's another system called pass faces where instead of objects like this, you're looking at faces and they did the research and it turns out that if you let people pick, they pick attractive faces and it's uh, men in particular are very easy to guess what their password is. Okay, so in this research, we stumbled into actually having sort of designed the idea of the system, we stumbled into a number of psychological theories that help explain why the system is actually a, a reasonable idea. Um, and I'll talk about those here. So first of all, we, uh, the queued R system is, stands for queued recognition, where we have cues that uh, you've seen a little bit of, and we have recognition as opposed to recall. So to distinguish between them, um, recall is when you go, um, what was the name of that theory again? I would, you know, strength something, uh, okay, yeah, strength theory, right? So I have, if I have the actual list, that's recognition. I can just pick out the theory that I'm thinking of from the list when I see it. Uh, there's a couple of theories that explain 
why this tech, why recognition is easier than recall. Uh, one is called generate recognize theory. Did we have a question? Okay, so the question is, isn't looking at a, isn't a, a password, remembering a password, like looking at a keyboard and um, reckon you, you see all 26 letters and, and all the numbers and so on, and you recognize, well, which one is the next one? Um, so, yes, yeah, so here's, so here's uh, the answer is yes, it is recognition in, the sen in that sense, but at any given moment, if you have the full keyboard, lowercase and uppercase and all the digits and so on, are, are, you're saying if you just have the 26 letters? Yes, let's see. Um, Uh, yes, you'd have to swap, okay, so you could put animal stickers on your keyboard, but you'd have to swap them in and out uh, for every, uh, each of the different, um, each character of the keyboard. So you'd have to have each one be like an LED screen that uh, shows you. Uh, well, if you wanted to, um, make it easier to remember than just having a sequence of, of the s animals, right? So it's not. Well, I mean, in one it's uh, no because, okay, so the uh, supposition is that you'd, it'd be easier to remember if the animals don't change. And what I'm saying is like animals compared to plants compared to, um, transportation, and if you have to remember it's one animal, uh, it's one of these 26 animals, and then in the next letter you have to remember it's one of these same 26 animals, and the last one was different, but it's still here. So if, okay, so. Okay, so this is one aspect. Uh, so the, the statement was, it, it, does that mean it's, a, it's easy to remember that it's a set of animals uh, and then a set of transportation? Um, and uh, the point is not the categorization. The point is that it's different, a different set of stuff that you see each time. So if you see a different set of stuff each time, and um, Yes, because you don't have confusion between the last scene and the, and the, the current scene. So that's one aspect of uh, the answer. Um, I, so, so yes, yeah, so that's why it would be better than statically labeling the keyboard with animals. Um, okay, so. I think I kind of answered the question. I don't think I completely answered it, but I, I think I need to continue. So, um, so the two theories are generate recognize theory and strength theory. Uh, strength theory is a, a sort of more subtle thing that just says, well, as you get a little bit more of this information, you're able to, to pick it out easier. Uh, generate recognize theory actually says that in your mind, what you're doing when you do a recall task is you first do a, generate a list of things that it might be, and then you do a recognize step later, so that would explain why it's easier to do recognition than recall, because you just eliminate one of the steps. Right? You just have to do the recall, uh, the recognition step. Okay, um, another thing is that it's good to have cues at both registration and at login. Um, and this is because of a theory called encoding specificity, or encoding specificity theory. Uh, encoding specificity theory says that if you have uh, a learning task and then you have the, you want to set the same conditions in the testing task in order for the subject to be able to successfully recall what needs to be recalled. Whereas if you, 
you know, in that case, memorization it works well. If you change the conditions, for example, you make the mouse drunk, well, then the learning does not happen as well. I don't know what happens if you start the mouse drunk, but that's, that's another story. Um, all right, so picture, or, picture superiority effect says that pictures are better than words, and of course you know that that's uh, generally speaking the case. Um, the, it's also the case if you just say, if you present people with a set of pictures and ask them to remember them, and as opposed to a set of words and ask them to remember those, that they do better with the pictures. Um, now there's a couple of theories uh, for this. One is dual coding theory, which says that when you see a picture, you also have, so if you see a picture of a zebra, in your mind you also have the word zebra that's sort of imprinted along with the picture of the zebra. So that helps give you two pieces of coding information. Uh, the sensory semantic theory says that, well, it's more that, you know, the picture has so much richness. So there's so much more sensory detail that's coming into you. Um, and, and in fact, they've done a study that says, well, if you have a bunch of similar looking pictures, the picture superiority effect tends to go away. Right? So if you just give people a bunch of, you know, you give people a picture of the sun and an orange, and they're both, you know, orange things about this big, um, and an orange ball, and they're all different things. They're all quite distinct things, but they're all visually similar, and so people will have more difficulty in remembering, uh, the, for example, the sequence. Okay, so another thing is that spatial information is useful uh, for helping keep track of, oh, let me fix that. Spatial information is helpful for helping keep track of things. Uh, so there's this uh, theory called semantic priming, um, and so you're just recognizing an object based on the things around it, the relationship with what's around it. Um, and another thing is that it's good to require effort. You know, of course, we don't want to burden the user too much, but we do need to require some effort uh, because of the levels of processing effect or the depth of processing effect. Um, so, for example, if I just say, well, here's a list of colors and there's the color, um, you might be able to remember that your assigned color is blue. But if I show you this picture and I talk about how the sky grew darker, painted blue on blue, one stroke at a time, into deeper and deeper shades of night, and you process all of that, that's going to help you probably remember a little bit better that the assigned color is actually blue. Okay, so how does this play into the design of cute R? So we have pictures. Uh, hence, we take advantage of the picture superiority effect. We have spatial information. In particular, uh, the way we set this up is that the zebra is always in the same position. So it's always in towards the upper left-hand corner, not all the way in the upper left-hand corner. It's also relatively, uh, we also have relative spatial cues. So we have, it's always right next to the cheetah and the elephant, it's always above the koala. And so we have additional information that's going to help the user keep track of where is this, uh, where is my animal in the animal's, pick, uh, in the animal's portfolio? Um, oh yeah, there it is, it's zebra, and I find, uh, so by the way, the way the scheme works is we find the letter, the user has to find the letter, in this case it's I, that letter is going to change every time they log in, in this instantation of the scheme. Uh, they type the letter I, they hit enter, they go to the next portfolio. Okay, we have verbal cues, so this is going to help with the depth of processing. Uh, people are going to read this additional fact that is shown over here on the left. Every zebra has a unique pattern of stripes. And we use some sort of real uh, fact about the animal or whatever it is that the object is that's being pictured. And of course there's the actual word zebra that's sitting there, so we have some verbal information. All right, so, um, so this is the basic QDAR scheme. With our base version, again, we've got six, uh, essentially we have six character random passwords. Uh, each, uh, we have 26 um, possible letters or uh, keywords that can be selected or rather uh, assigned by the system. And the user is supposed to remember 
uh, six different ones on six different portfolios. One image is equal to one character of the password. Okay, so we did a user study. We had users come in, learn their QDAR password, come back a week later, and demonstrate that they knew or didn't know their QDAR password. And with our 37 users, we got 100% memorability. The uh, as far as we can tell, as far as our search of the literature, we don't know of any other password scheme that has 100% memorability. Um, uh, the other schemes that have high memorability in the 90s percentile uh, will have, uh, are often for lower entropy passwords on the order of 13 or 14 bits. Yes. Um, I believe we asked them to not write it down. Um, and we can't necessarily control for that. Right? They could have left the area and written it down. Um, but yeah, we followed for you know, fairly standard instructions on that sort of thing. Uh, we know that they didn't write it down in our presence while, we, while they were there in the lab. Right, and um, in a lot of these studies, you'll see some more, uh, some other studies where we have some, some different variants and you can see some differences between things. Um, I believe in this, either this study or one of the earlier studies, we did do um, a control with six character, just the letters, um, and they don't do as well on that. Now, we can't really claim that that's a perfect condition because when users know that you know I'm presented with this thing that's obviously a control and this thing that is probably your scheme that you want me to do well on this so maybe I'll try harder on this right that 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 phenomenon exists so we can't necessarily say but I mean the, the recall rates on uh, six character random passwords generally uh, system assigned are, are quite low and that's been in the literature as well um, all right, so we had, so we asked them about their feedback. The feedback was quite good overall. Uh, people said that they'd be willing to use something like this instead of uh, regular passwords on, on different types of sites. Um, and we also did a multiple password pilot study where we had people remember three different QDAR passwords, one associated with each of three different accounts, and then come back a week later, and uh, it was a small pilot study, so I think we only had about 10 users, um, but there was, a, again, 100% memorability on three system assigned passwords. Um, I believe not, and in fact, I think in this case, we probably have enough portfolios that there might have been no overlap in any of them. Um, I think that's the most likely setup. Okay, so that was the main idea of the work that we presented at CHI this year. Um, now I'm gonna talk about uh, a couple of other studies that we've published that have to do with some more detailed study of the different types of cues and their effects. And I'll go through this pretty quickly. So some of the variants that we're interested in, well, uh, I mentioned pass faces. There's a screenshot of the pass faces system. Um, we also have objects that we've seen from QDAR. Uh, and uh, some studies have said that objects might be better, uh, of course, the whole basis, the premise of pass faces and why it's a commercially deployed system is that humans are believed to have a special facility for remembering faces. Um, you know, if you show little babies pictures, like just line drawings of things that look kind of like a face and then something that doesn't look similar but doesn't look like a face, they look at the face thing for a longer period of time, they hold their gaze to it a longer period of time. So, there's some evidence that there's an innate capability for remembering faces, so 
uh, you know, maybe they can be assigned some faces and, and remember those. Another question we had is, well, do we need all the cues? You know, we have graphical cues, spatial cues, verbal cues. Do we need all of these in order to be successful? Um, and we're also going to look at user, uh, user interaction on the system. So in the user interaction portion, what we're having the users do is, let's say they've been assigned a turtle as their uh, password on this screen. Um, and then the user is given a box in the upper right hand corner and they're required to type something into that box. And what we tell them as instructions is you should type in something that's going to help you remember that this is the turtle has been assigned to you. Uh, and then they type something in. And we, we then, uh, in our study, of course, we keep that information because we want to know what people typed in. But in, uh, in practice, what you would just do as a server is just throw this away. You wouldn't want to keep this information because it would obviously be very revealing as to what the person's password is. You would never show it to anybody. Uh, it would not be a valid cue. But we're just using it as a piece of information that's going to get people to try to uh, go through the process of interacting and engaging with their password. Uh, and I don't know why there's, oh, and so yeah, at login there's no indicator of, of what this verbal, uh, what they've typed in. And what this does uh, in terms of the theory is that it helps with the levels of processing effect. So, we start out with something in our working memory, turtle, 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 okay, how am I gonna remember that? Um, and then they go through some additional elaborate processing beyond just sort of the rote memorization of turtle. And by doing this elaborate processing, that helps to store something into their long-term memory. And so that's the idea. Okay, so then based on these different questions that we had, so the first study I told, I'll tell you about appeared in SOUPS this year. Okay, so one thing is how about objects versus faces? By the way, how many people know who that is? I mean, a Canadian audience, but so that's uh, John Boehner, the now former Speaker of the House of Representatives in the US, and I'm just taking a cheap pot shot at him because uh, he is known to uh, be unusually tan, so uh, he has been likened to an orange many a time. So objects turn out to do pretty much about as well as faces. So if we just, if we don't have the spatial cues, we don't have the verbal cues, we just have the images, then uh, they do about the same. They're not statistically significantly different. Um, I believe that in so in this case, you see objects did a little bit better. In another case, it turned out that faces did a little bit better. So um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference. Uh, I was actually a little bit surprised by this. We had uh, an earlier paper that suggested that objects might actually be better. Uh, one of the reasons that could be is that you have, uh, you have a picture of a dog, and then you have a picture of an orange, and then you have a picture of a laptop, and those are three visually very distinct things. And so you might have a better ability to, to pick out your thing from the picture, uh, the portfolio that you're being shown. Um, but of course, there, were, there is also this uh, idea that maybe we're really good at picking out faces, and it turns out they seem to be roughly equivalent. Now, you note that these uh, login success rates are really much lower, and they're really not as good. So that's another thing that we learned in this, um, of course, is also backed up by prior research, that if all you have is a set of pictures, that's not going to be sufficient. Pictures and, uh, and I guess, the word, the name of the object. Um, okay, so another finding is that, oh, yes? Yes. So, 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 so it could be done, like, uh, it, I would expect that if we're 
much better at understanding spaces that we can essentially make up for that by having a larger group of all of our teachers from a larger category. OK, so um, I forgot to actually mention some of the changes. You might notice in this that we don't, uh, OK, so the what was being just mentioned is that um, we have, um, so in QDAR, which are the original QDAR that I showed earlier, we had a set of animals. And so we have these portfolios that are in a fixed category. So what would happen, uh, you know, is it perhaps the case that um, a, a more visually distinct set of uh, portfolios would be helpful? And actually, that's what we did. So if you look here, this is one of uh, the portfolios. Now, in this case, the portfolios are randomly generated uh, without replacement. So from one portfolio to the next, you wouldn't see any of the same objects. But the, what you see here is that so we have you know, some earrings and a steering wheel and some forks. And basically, we just took all of the different objects that we had from QDAR, and we just randomly sampled from that to create a portfolio. Um, so we actually have visual distinctness on different types of objects. Um, another thing I should point out is that as we did these studies, um, we actually lowered the amount of entropy. So we used five panels of 16 objects each. And that actually gives you about 20 bits of entropy. And the research has indicated that if what you're concerned about is online attacks, so the attacks where uh, the attacker never gets a hold of the backend database, then this is sufficient. Right? So that's what we're going with for this. Okay, so we've done two different ones in the studies that I'm talking about. The letters change every time. So every. Yeah, is your password, the thing that you should remember is steering wheel, truck, bottle of water, whatever. Right? And then you just type whatever letter. And you type whatever letter happens to be there this time. And it change, it's going to change every time. So what is the benefit? How many pictures do I choose? Uh, you are assigned one picture from each of five portfolios, so you, are, you have to remember five things. Oh, so we have five panels and I pick one picture on each. You are assigned one from each. You don't pick. Um, so the benefit of, of this is that it helps to um, limit the impact of observation attacks, such as uh, keystroke sniffing, like a dumb keystroke sniffer. If all it does is take your keystrokes, it's not going to learn your password because it keeps changing. Um, if you have someone doing shoulder surfing, there is a benefit where what they have to do in order to shoulder surf successfully is they have to see what's on the screen, and they also have to um, see what it is that you are typing because that's going to change next time. So they're going to have to link those two things up at this very moment. Now, they can solve that by taking a video. Right? And we all have smartphones. You turn on the video of your smartphone. You videotape maybe the one thing happening while you're watching the other thing. And you can probably piece it together later. So it's not a foolproof thing, but it helps to, helps to prevent those attacks. Yes? Right, so uh, the point was that if you don't change the letters, it's going to make it easier to remember. Um, and we are exploring this, actually. Um, and the other thing that it's going to provide, I forgot to mention, um, QDAR has a, like the, the real big downside to it. It has a long login time. Um, you know, on the order of 35 to 40 seconds is the login time. So that's really high relative to just a password that you type in. It's in line with other systems like it. So other systems that are recognition-based recognition graphical passwords where you are assigned like pass faces. Um, it, the login time is fairly similar to that, but the login time is high. But if we can get it to where uh, it's the same thing every time, we lose the benefit of the 
resilience to shoulder surfing, but we get the benefit that the login time should be faster and maybe memorization will be aided. So, good point. Okay, so the next finding is that spatial cues don't really help, which is, I think, very surprising. Uh, they didn't help in the recall rates, as you see here. Uh, this is one example with faces, random, random position. We actually do a little bit better than with, uh, spatial, with the spatial cues. And we, um, we have a little bit of maybe a guess as to why, but we really don't know why, why that's the case. Um, the, uh, but it was consistent. So it was also consistent with objects. Uh, we did a little bit better when we didn't have spatial cues. So one thing that was apparently effective was user interaction. So when we have user interaction, uh, the uh, login success rate actually jumps into the 90, 90s percent. So we've got out of a, you know, a study, uh, with maybe some 60 people in it, we've got only a few people who are not remembering their whole password. Uh, and these are statistically significantly better than the other ones, the other login rates that I showed in before. The best scheme that we had was when we had objects and we had spatial cues, which may not have helped, but they were there, and we had uh, the verbal cues, which is basically just like QDAR. And so when we had basically the QDAR scheme, uh, we had a 98% login success rate. One thing I want to point out is that the users in this case had to remember seven different passwords in order, because this was a within group scheme. So within group uh, user study. So each user came in, they had seven different assigned passwords and still they're getting 98% success on, on one of the schemes. So I think that's pretty good. Um, the other findings, so registration time is clearly higher for the schemes that were more successful. So the one I just mentioned, object with spatial and um, verbal cues did the best, but it also requires the most time at registration. And that makes sense. You basically have more depth of processing. The more depth of processing that you have, the better people are going to actually remember these things later on. Uh, the login times were, uh, registration times were also quite large for the user interaction schemes, which again had a higher, higher success rate. Uh, the login times uh, varied just um, all over the board, but actually you know, fairly consistently between all the schemes and uh, more successful did not necessarily make it um, slower or faster. So the other study I want to tell you about briefly, we presented at Asorix just a couple months ago. Uh, in this one, we had three study conditions, um, and I'll just go through them first. The control condition, we had textual recognition. All this is, we show a panel of 16 words, and we get you to remember your assigned word. So your assigned word is eyeshadow. So you should remember eyeshadow. Um, and then you have a panel of five different words that you're supposed to remember. This is a technique that was already studied previously and was shown as we will show that it um, doesn't do any better than just six random characters, lowercase letters. Uh, the next condition we call text V because it's textual recognition with a verbal cue. So in this case, we've added verbal cues. So if you're assigned popcorn, you have also the verbal cue. Americans consume 16 billion quarts of popcorn. And then the final study condition, we have, again, essentially cued R. We have graphical recognition uh, with the word, with the verbal cue, uh, but without the, so QDAR without spatial cues. The login success rate, uh, as you can see, we do the control condition at about 60 some percent is very much in line with prior work on textual recognition, random assigned uh, strings. 
Um, text B and graphic B both do much better, significantly better than the control condition and in the 90s. Uh, the registration time, of course, is much larger for these two schemes and not different between them. And then for the login time, the thing I want to point out is that uh, the textual recognition was slower than the graphical recognition. And so this indicates that even though textual and graphical recognition were not significantly different between them in terms of their login success rate, it did improve the login time to include the images. So when possible, including the images is a good idea. No, the, so, okay, so the text was not user input. The text was user, uh, was um, the verbal cue given by the system. Okay. So now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about this other technique called the memory palace. And the reason we're going to consider uh, what is uh, quite a significant other technique significantly different technique, um, is that it's still the case that people use text-based password interfaces for large numbers of systems, and it's not going to be necessarily easy for a system to replace that. And in some cases, it's going to be basically completely impossible to replace it with something like QDAR. So we still want to have system-assigned passwords, but we have these situations where we're not going to have all these nice pictures and verbal cues and so on at the time of login. So can we do something that's going to uh, help people in any case? Also, if you're typing in a text password, then you have the benefit if you learn the text password, then over time you get faster at it, and it becomes not just explicit memory where you remember, okay, um, it's a turtle and then a clock. Instead, it's implicit memory where it's basically just your, your hand typing. And you probably have a number of passwords that you have down of based on implicit memory. So the memory palace, uh, this is, so it's also called the method of loci, but I think memory palace is easier to remember, so that's what I call it. Um, and the way the memory palace system works. I'll tell you about it. Uh, okay. Um, so the memory palace is a memory technique that's used by people who, there, there are people who go and like get really good at learning very quickly. The, uh, you take a shuffle deck of cards and you give it to them and they memorize the order, the sequence of the deck of cards. Right? And how do they do this? Are they born with brilliant memories? Now what they say is, no, we were not born with brilliant memories. Instead, we learned these techniques, such as the memory palace technique, and we just studied them a lot and just practiced them a lot. And so, hey, if it's good enough for people who can remember a deck of cards, then maybe it's good enough for people to remember their system assigned passwords. So the basic idea is you imagine that you walk into your home. So you see the front entrance to your home. You walk up to the entrance, and you see that there's some kind of object there. And so you're supposed to remember there's this object at the front of your home. And then you walk into the entrance of your home and you see the first room in your house. And you go, OK, then you see here's this other second object in the foyer of your house. And then you keep going room by room in a sequence. And you just make sure that you keep the same sequence, some kind of logical sequence that you can keep in your mind. Um, and you just can go through the room putting one object at a time until you've completed the whole list of objects. Ah, yes. All right, so now let's see if we can get a video to work. All right, so in this case, the user has been assigned the password PKURSG, and we're going to try to help them remember this password. Okay, now, so now you see the entrance of the apartment. You go up to the mailbox, and on top of the mailbox, we have. Okay, so the first, the first go around, we're actually just going to see the video um, without any of the objects to get you familiarized because we're not going to be telling the user, hey, remember your house growing up. We're going to show them a video of this particular apartment. So we're going to first sequence them through the apartment so that they get familiar with the sequence and how it goes. Now, the second time around, they're going to actually see the objects 
So first there's a pencil that is apparently spearing its way through the mailbox, and that's the P. And then we have a keyboard sitting on the couch in the living room, and that's the K. And then we have an umbrella that's opened up on top of the kitchen counter. A rocket on the dining table. A star on the bed. Yeah, I mean, they're not meant to be things that you would normally have in your house, at least in this, you know, on top of your bathtub, you would not usually have a guitar. Um, but that is kind of the point, right? We're gonna try to help you remember something, and so if it was just the same thing you already do have in your house, you won't remember that as some distinct thing, right? We want things that um, had two properties. We picked out objects that are going to uh, go well with the, the letter. So when you think of the letter uh, that the object might come to mind, it might not be the very first thing, but there can be, you know, we want to have a, a fairly strong relationship there. Um, and that we were careful to, to try to pick objects that don't have too many interpretations. Um, so a ball uh, is one of our objects, and so we have this big beach ball. Uh, actually, no, we have a big basketball. And so whether you think of that as a ball or basketball, it still starts with B, and there's not gonna be an issue for the user. Whereas if we had picked a soccer ball, uh, you know, then who knows. All right, so we did our first study with this. Uh, we got a lower rate of recall, but what we are having users do in this case is they come in, they type in the password, they don't have any cues. So I mentioned the encoding specificity theory says that you should have cues. Uh, we didn't give them cues, and they still remembered uh, their password, 86% of them, one week later. Um, and you can see the real benefit of this scheme as opposed to something like QDAR, the mean, uh, median login time was nine seconds. So that's um, just a few seconds um, slower than the people who had learned uh, without using the method of loci for the people who could successfully log in. Um, again, a control condition uh, showed that people had trouble just remembering random six characters. Uh, we've also done studies. We've done uh, a another study off of this. Uh, we have a high percentage of people who can remember 12 character passwords. Now the initial memory rate is something, uh, is somewhat lower, it's in the 70s, uh, but we can then show them the, the home, we can show them the home, and we also have an office that we use to extend this to 12 characters, and then if we just show them without the objects, we can, the rate goes up to the 90s again, and that's, um, you know, really just using the scheme for the first time uh, a whole week later after you've just learned the password once um, is, we think it's pretty good. And, and especially in the 12 character password, we get this uh, pseudo cryptographic level of security. And that's something where we think that could have a lot of applications because if you have a situation like you have a single sign on password for work, you go in, you, it's for work, you have to learn it. So you take the five minutes or eight minutes that it takes to learn a, the whole password, but now you've got a 12 character password and you've got it down. Um, and there's some prior work that shows, well, people can learn 56 bit passwords, but the previous work said, we're going to take a 90 day session and have people type in the password repeatedly many times over those 90 days and of course, you know, that's not really practical unless you already have your first cryptographically strong password and you learn the other one while you log in, every time you log into work. Okay, so in conclusion, we've talked about how queues can aid memory and in particular how the QDAR system provides a highly memorable 
uh, graphical, verbal, and spatial cue-based password. Uh, we talked a little bit about some additional studies where we did some uh, detailed analysis about what kind of cues are useful and how we can compare the different cues. And uh, we talked about this memory palace technique, which provides learning aids that can help you remember textual, text-only passwords. And with that, I'll take any more questions you might have. Okay, so the question is, is there work on um, getting people to remember a long but grammatically correct sentence? Yeah, not, not random words. Yeah, not random words. Um, the answer is yes. I don't remember off the top of my head um, the exact study, uh, but I believe I've read about this. And one of the problems is that people remember the gist of a sentence, so they remember the meaning of the sentence. And they also can take that information and construct another grammatically correct sentence, but it doesn't match the original sentence. And that's, of course, the big problem with passwords. You had a question? So. Uh, the question is, do you imagine using this in a password management type setting or um, where you have exactly one password to deal with or just for general use? And um, for sure, the former. Uh, it's definitely much more appropriate to have people go through a 12-minute or six-minute uh, you know, training session. Um, I think the video here is a three-minute video um, when the whole thing is done because we do another loop that I didn't show you. And um, uh, that that's much more appropriate for a setting where basically I can require you to learn the password at the very least. Because if you're, you know, the way websites work, if I don't like your registration process, I will find another website that does almost exactly the same thing as your website, and I will never go to your website again. So, so that probably isn't going to fly for the most part. It might also make sense for some of these schemes um, for banking passwords. Um, or another way to consider deployment is for the uh, system to just let you have your regular textual password, but then um, do some proactive password checking on it. Um, and uh, you know, basically do a dictionary attack against the password and see if it matches you know, in the first however many on their list, and if it does, say, well, you know, your password really isn't strong enough, either add this on as an additional thing, maybe a shorter one, an ex here's an extra 20 bits of entropy, learn it, add it to your password, then you'll be fine. Uh, or just, you know, here's, a, here's this other thing, your password isn't really that good, we suggest you use this other thing, that might also be viable, um, but probably, you know, yeah, for general, general purpose. So one of the things that's, um, I, I think, recommended by most security experts is that you do reuse your passwords, um, basically because there's no way you're gonna be able to remember a password for every single site that you've ever visited, which is in the hundreds, surely, uh, that you've created accounts on. And I mean, it's certainly hundreds for me, I don't know about you. Um, the and in that case, there's a large swath of sites for which reusing the same silly password is just fine because there's no significant security risk to you, there's no significant security risk to the site. Um, it's just a thing that allows you to have your account as opposed to someone else's account, um, but you don't have you know, really sensitive information and that kind of stuff. So that's, you, in order to enable that, you have to have these textual passwords or you know, use password managers on your browser and so on. Yes?
OK, so the question is, have you studied basically password interference and multiple password issues where you know, if you're given many different passwords using the same scheme, will you, know, will you start to fail at memorizing? Um, what we have um, done so far, so I'll, t I'll tell you about two things. Um, so one thing is that we've done, uh, we did the multiple password pilot study, but we only went up to three passwords on that. Um, and of course, in this other study, we did seven different conditions. So people had to remember seven different things, and if they could remember you know, one of them with 98% success rate, that's at least a decent indicator that they get somewhere. Um, although I'm pretty sure there's some limits. Um, but I don't know how to reasonably test them, uh, because once you get up past uh, seven, you know, you have to set up an experiment that's very complex about how do people go through the process of you learn a password and then you learn the next password a few days later and you learn the next one a week later and you know you have to space all that out and you have to do a full field study of about getting people to log in repeatedly at other different times in order to validate that that it's all realistic. You know, that's very difficult. Um, the so one thing we have done is a multiple password interference study of another system uh, developed at Carleton called GeoPass, where your password is a location on a, a user-selected location on a Google map. And this is a, it's a really nice uh, technique, but one of the big problems we found with it is there is significant uh, interference between different accounts. Uh, and we've uh, developed a counter to that, which is to uh, ask the user to do this user, uh, user interaction thing of typing in a story. Um, but we ask them, type in a story that will help you remember that your bank password is um, you know, this, the location that you select. And we tell them, you know, we're going to do that when you select the location. So, you know, you, so one person said, OK, well, I picked the, uh, the Bellagio in Las Vegas because that reminds, so when I think about bank, I think money. When I think money, I think Vegas. When I think Vegas, I think Bellagio. Right? They, they made that story. And so that might be one way of dealing with it. We don't, there are potential security implications about doing that. Uh, multiple people might, you know, how many people are going to pick Fort Knox for their bank password? Um, so we don't know what all of those are, but that's one way of potentially addressing those issues. But it, that said, I don't necessarily recommend this for general web use for that reason as well. Okay, yes. we're out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs>